This is one of the most universally popular and supported initiatives uh, and developments of many, many years. I think you'll see new members, and I also think you'll see uh, an evolution in the region that has not previously been possible. Welcome to Global Perspectives. This week's episode is dedicated to the anniversary of the signing of the Abraham Accords, the peace deals brokered by the Trump administration one year ago between the United Arab Emirates, Bahrain, and Israel. These warm peace deals were quickly followed by two additional peace deals between Sudan, the Kingdom of Morocco, and Israel, also brokered by the Trump administration. It was my privilege to be a member of the administration's War and Peace team, and today it is my pleasure to bring to you two of the architects of the Abraham Accords, Dr. Victoria Coates and Mr. Robert Greenway. Victoria Coates is Senior Fellow and Director for the Middle East and North Africa at the Center for Security Policy. Her previous positions include Deputy Assistant to the President and Deputy National Security Advisor for Middle Eastern and North African Affairs on the National Security Council. Robert Greenway is Executive Director of the Abraham Accords Institute of Peace. Robert Greenway has more than 30 years experience in public service, culminating as the senior U.S. government official responsible for developing, coordinating, and implementing U.S. government policy for all of the Middle East and North Africa on the National Security Council. Victoria Coates, Rob Greenway, it's really my honor and pleasure to have you on with me on Global Perspectives. Thanks so much for joining me. Thank you, Ellie. Thanks, Ellie. Great to be here. So we are dedicating this episode to the anniversary of the signing of the Abraham Accords, which took place on September 15th, one year ago today, on the South Lawn of the White House. And it's a day that I will never forget. I wanted to ask each of you, what do you attribute the success of the Trump administration in brokering these warm peace deals, which um, for the audience to understand what we mean when we say warm peace includes full diplomatic relations between the United Arab Emirates, Bahrain, and then of course later on Morocco and Sudan, which joined as well in these deals. Um, but full diplomatic relations, opening of embassies, direct flights between these countries, um, business to business, people to people relationships, things that we did not see with the um, Egyptian peace with Israel and the Jordanian peace as well. Well, I guess I'd just, I'd say that President Trump brought a great deal of clarity to the uh, US-Israel relationship in terms of taking the very fundamental steps of moving the U.S. Embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem, you know, that was really sort of the groundbreaking, uh, groundbreaking policy. But there were others. There was recognizing Golan uh, Heights. And what that did is it gave the region a great deal of clarity about the, where the United States stood, that the United States-Israel relationship was inviolable and wasn't going away. And so if they wanted to be close to the United States, they needed to be close to Israel. And I think that's really what laid the foundation. I'd have to add too, um, to what Victoria stated, that we were willing to challenge assumptions, so deeply held beliefs about what was possible in the Middle East and how we could work with partners to sort of uh, to break free from previous uh, failures. And I think also we were leveraging our relationships. Uh, from the beginning, of course, President Trump famously visited the region and made it a priority. And I think also the alignment of our stated national security interests with those of our partners was a critical foundation. And that trust enabled us to do things, I think, that were not previously possible. All told, I think it's the beginning of a transformation in the region and one that our hopes are that it be sustained and expanded. Well, and, and Rob, I really appreciate the, the segue of what you just said, which is uh, here we are one year later. Um, I think that many observers felt that the recent Gaza conflict between Hamas and Israel was perhaps the first test of the Abraham Accords. So I'm curious, uh, each of you and Rob, maybe you could tell us first, what's your assessment one year later? So I think despite the fact that many claimed that it was severely stressing uh, the, the nature of the relationships, I have to say my perspective and conversations with partners in the region tells a different story. 
I think all of them universally uh, lauded the fact that they now had open avenues of communication with each other that previously were not possible. It's not that they couldn't communicate before, it's just now with the Accords, it's not only above the surface, but it's also expanded to encompass the entirety of the organizations and their governments that are responsible, I think, for dealing with crises like what we saw with Gaza. And so in the Emirates case, but not limited to them, and Bahrain as well, they were able to communicate with their partners how they thought this could be resolved. And I think all of uh, the parties, uh, including Egypt, would recognize that their willingness and, and their ability to work together was instrumental in achieving the ceasefire on terms that were, I think, consistent with Israel's security interests. And I think going forward, we'll see an expansion of that. But I think in any case, the Accords laid the foundation for increased communication, which is always instrumental in resolving conflict. Now, I, I not surprisingly agree with Rob, but I think what what was surprising about the the Gaza flare-up, particularly in comparison to the one in, in 2014, is that the Abraham Accords facilitated uh, resolving the conflict, that rather than you know having this kind of knee-jerk response from the region to condemn, condemn Israel and, and just take the Palestinian side, there, there was an openness to how this was going to be resolved. And I think that really should give us a great deal of hope for the future. Exactly right. I think that, um, that in fact, it looked like the Abraham Accords came through with flying colors after the, the Hamas conflict in, in the fact that the relationships did not break down and there was no diplomatic fallout. And as you just said, Victoria, um, in fact, Israel probably saw more, more support in this conflict than they had ever historically. Um, which brings me to, to my next question. Um, in October of last year, President Trump at the time made an announcement that there were at least five other countries in the region who were considering uh, additional normalization deals with Israel. What's your understanding of that uh, back in October of 2020 and today? Where do you think things stand? Well, happy to, to, to take a, a first swing at that, Eliana, and I'm glad you brought it up because ultimately, of course, our efforts uh, that the Abraham Accords Peace Institute are designed to sustain and hopefully expand the number of signatories to the Accords. And I think we're going to see that take multiple forms. Some will approach diplomatic relations. Some will reinforce uh, relationships they've already got in the economic and in the cultural. And our hope is that incrementally, at least, we can continue the work we did before the transition of administrations and expand the number of Accords signatories. And so what I think the president was then referring to and what many of us have referred to subsequently is the fact that many countries have seen one, the essential nature of this and why it's important for the countries economically and from a diplomatic perspective, and why it's vital, I think, to recover from the global pandemic, as well as to expanding future prosperity. So for the signatories of the Accords members now, all of them, I think, recognize Israel as a critical partner uh, in a variety of reasons. And I think that the, the appetite to expand among additional countries is based on that same recognition, that partnership with Israel in an economic, cultural, and diplomatic uh, respect is critical to their future prosperity. Well, and I think that, uh, you know, it's been encouraging to hear positive words out of the new Biden administration about the Abraham Accords. I mean, I think it's it's hard to be the enemy of peace. So I would be hopeful that they would continue to do this work. And I think it's also important to note that it's not a cookie cutter situation. You know, we have other countries that have various degrees of, of relationships with Israel that are warming them, like Azerbaijan. So that could be incremental, um, you know. A lot of people are watching regional countries such as Saudi Arabia, Oman, there are others. And then, you know, we could look farther afield into, into Southeast Asia and, and other locations. But I think the having the positive benefits of the Accords so obvious after the course of a year will, will only accelerate this over time. And you were both, um, you know, directors of Middle East North Africa policy writ large for the Trump administration. You each spoke earlier about the trust that the United States built with our allies in the region. And so, of course, that brings me to uh, the Trump administration's Iran policy. Um, I know that uh, many in the Trump administration spoke on this about the fact that our Gulf Arab allies understand Iran to be the number one threat to them in the region. They understand that the Israelis are actually incredibly important in countering that threat. 
and that the Trump administration's Iran policy was fundamental to helping to bring the region to peace. I would um, appreciate, Victoria, your thoughts first on that. Well, we've we've sometimes uh, joked ironically that that the group that really deserves the peace prize for this is is the Iranian regime, because they had such a wonderful effect bringing folks together. And I think you know the the reality that Israel is not the one that's directing missiles at you know Saudi Arabia and UAE from Yemen. You know Israel is not the one who's destroying Lebanon, taking apart Syria or Iraq. Uh, you know, that Israel can be part of the solution. I think that realization has been fundamental uh, and that if you want a security partner in the region, uh, you could you could do a whole lot worse. And and many of them have. And so I think they they are eager for the security cooperation with with Israel, and by extension, the United States that these agreements represent. I think that's exactly right. And I think we saw this early on, uh, as I mentioned before, the visit to the region, the agreement on fundamental issues of what threatened regional security. And I think when when Warsaw convened in February of 19, we saw the region's leadership, including Israel, sit on the same stage and unequivocally state the greatest threat to their peace and stability, and that of the region uh, came from, emanated from Iran. And I think that broad agreement and the trust in each other and in the, the previous administration uh, recognized the fact that uh, that this was, in fact, possible. And from that point forward, our efforts redoubled. And I think, again, that foundation and trust was uh, unequivocally important and critical ingredient in making the accords happen. They understood from the beginning that we were of the same mind and that Israel certainly saw the same security threats. And on that foundation, much has been accomplished. So this this past week, we saw um, Israel's new prime minister, Naftali Bennett, make his first visit to uh, the White House and have his first meeting with President Joe Biden. And they left that meeting with uh, some of the readout being that um, Naftali Bennett has kind of promised not to publicly uh, criticize the expect, expectation that perhaps the United States will be re-entering the, the Iran deal, the JCPOA. And so Bennett will not be criticizing it. And yet he also had a conversation with President Biden that um, that if diplomacy fails, apparently the United States is still open to other options. Do you think that um, the region is where it was when you left office when it comes to the understanding of the Iranian threat or, or perhaps knowing how the United States will relate to the U.S. threat, to the Iranian threat, sorry? Well, I think what was reassuring about the meeting was that, you know, it ultimately, uh, you know, it doesn't matter who the president of the United States is or the prime minister of Israel, the relationship is so valuable and so deep that it will continue. Uh, you know, democracies change administrations. That's what happens. And so, uh, you know, I was pleased to see them have a, a warm, a warm meeting. I think, unfortunately, the uh, the the confidence that the region had in the very clear uh, Trump administration policy towards Iran has been has been shaken. And I'm sure we'll get to this, but certainly recent events in Afghanistan have not been reassuring either. And so I. I, I worry that you know the that even if Prime Minister Bennett doesn't overtly criticize you know re, U.S. return to compliance with the JCPOA, it is such a difficult domestic political issue for him. I, I'm not sure how he threads that needle. So it 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 seems a, a, a difficult requirement to place on him. Uh, but as I said, overall, I was I was glad that the meeting happened. Yeah, it was an important meeting for sure, and I do think that most agree that the new prime minister achieved his objectives and and certainly agree uh, with Victoria that the relationship uh, will endure and has. I do think, though, that universally there, there is a great deal of concern among uh, the leadership in the region uh, as it pertains to risks uh, from Iran, but also from resurgent terrorist groups. Uh, and I do think also uh, there's a great deal of appreciation for the fact that the Accords is a critical uh, source of optimism. Uh, it's an area where, uh, you know, in a year plus of incredibly uh, difficult, challenging times, there is cause for optimism. And in fact, I think we've seen the results in the cultural and in the economic spheres, even notwithstanding great adversity. So I think 
in the end, the, the great risks that are in front of the region and the United States in it, uh, in some ways, uh, I think, are balanced by the fact that the Accords provides a new opportunity for countries to work together to face those threats. And ultimately, behind it all is an intent, I think, for U.S. partners in the region to work more closely together, certainly in the economic and in the cultural sphere. But I also think that could expand beyond it. Well, well, Rob, thanks for bringing that up. And so maybe we could stay on this point for, for a moment longer. Um, is your expectation that you are going to continue to see this regional cooperation? I personally um, am observing incredible people-to-people uh, embrace between Emiratis, Bahrainis, and Israelis, and Moroccans as well. Um, I'm curious your assessment on that, on the people-to-people -people relationships. Sure. Look, I think in the cultural side, you know, we just recently saw uh, flights uh, between Israel and Morocco and, of course, the strong relationship that exists between the two countries on a cultural level. So many Israelis have common heritage uh, in Morocco and, and, and vice versa. The business connections, um, while, while small, I think already existed and are being expanded rapidly. And I think that uh, the two go hand in hand. I think that the, the cultural ties between uh, Israel and the Gulf members of the Accords, likewise expanding, uh, commensurate with the, the travel restrictions associated with the coronavirus, and we can all appreciate that, I think. But we all anticipate that these two will abate in time, and preparations are being made now to coordinate what the new possibilities are between the flight connections between the countries, which radically changes not just the cultural connections, but the economic, because tourism, of course, is a great engine of economic prosperity across the region. Well, the Abraham Accords has definitely been a source of light, of inspiration, of peace in a region that uh, seems to consistently go through difficult times. And, and Victoria, you just mentioned a few minutes ago Afghanistan. I think it is the elephant in the room, and so I want to turn our conversation to that right now. Um, as you and I, you, 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 Rob, and I are speaking, um, we had 13 U.S. service members killed in Kabul uh, by a suicide bomber and, um, and over 100 Afghan civilians killed in this incident as well. Um, we've seen the U.S. take action since that time and um, developments are still unfolding on a daily basis as we speak. One of the things that also took place uh, soon after this uh, killing of American service people is that President Joe Biden had a um, press conference. And in that press conference, he pointed to the Trump administration as the reason why um, he's taken the decisions that he has in Afghanistan. And I, I'm hoping that you can both shed light for us on this issue. What I heard was Joe Biden blaming the Trump administration for his Afghanistan decisions. And so I'm just wondering, do you think that his description of, of his decision making in the sense that he, the way he describes it was that he was kind of forced into his decision making um, because of, uh, of the Trump administration's policies. Do you think that's a fair assessment on his part? Uh, I do not. Um, I think that, you know, the, the uh, Trump administration policy toward Afghanistan was evolutionary. It changed over time as, as circumstances changed over time. And, you know, the president understood instinctively or understands instinctively the significance of these kinds of assets. You know, Rob and I were with him in Christmas of 2018 when we went to the Al-Assad base in Iraq, and he really focused like a laser on the significance of that air base. And so I think, you know, I, I can't I can't go back and, and, and tell you what would have gone down in the, you know, the first seven months of or, of uh 2021, it had he been reelected, but I do think, you know, that that he would have had an understanding, even if we were going into a drawdown period, that the last thing you would do was take the military out and give up the military assets before you had secured the civilians. Uh, he was always intensely sensitive to getting our people home and making sure we were taking care of our folks abroad. So the suggestion that he would have, you know, closed Bagram in the dead of night and, you know, walked away without even telling our our Afghan partners uh, is is just it's not credible. 
And so I think uh, President Biden has shown himself very willing to change other aspects of Trump administration policy. And so had he actually had another solution to Afghanistan, I'm sure he would have pursued it. Uh, I think in, in a way he took this as, as an excuse to do what he has long wanted to do, what he did, what he recommended that the Obama administration do in Iraq, for example, which was a, a precipitous and uh, premature withdrawal that is, is handled in an extremely chaotic, poorly planned fashion and only leaves the door open to further chaos and terrorist attacks. So Rob, what policy prescriptions do you have? What would you like to see the United States do in the Middle East, North Africa region going forward? Well, as it pertains to Afghanistan, I think, uh, again, that partnership needs to translate into, uh, into coordination that encompasses the evacuation of all U.S. citizens, all uh, special uh, immigrant visa holders, uh, uh, local embassy staff, and all those at risk in Afghanistan. I think there needs to be a coordinated plan. It's starting to take shape, but there's all too many private efforts which have stepped in to fill the gap. I think there's room for improvement in the coordination among nations led by the United States, uh, because I think in the end, that is what is required in this circumstance to really finish the complete the coordination for evacuation of those at risk out of Afghanistan. And I think the infrastructure required to do that leads into my second recommendation, which is I think we really need to have infrastructure associated with the counterterrorism mission, which will certainly endure uh, in the weeks and months ahead. And I think that we're going to have to reduce that over the horizon dwell a good deal, because in the end, any precision strike requires precision intelligence that requires proximity. Uh, and we lack proximity if we vacate the region in its entirety. So I think we need to redouble our efforts to expand our infrastructure on the margins of Afghanistan. So proximity is going to be critically important. And I think the sooner we can establish ourselves in the region and adjacent countries, again, with partners, I think we could begin to close the gap on our understanding and our visibility, which is required to enable effective counterterrorism. But I also think that our mission isn't restricted to counterterrorism alone. I think we have very valid and important counterproliferation uh, mission in Afghanistan as well, and so do our partners and allies. Looking both east and west, we have grave concerns, and I think that has always been a central argument for maintaining a residual presence in the region, if not Afghanistan proper. And last, I would say we need to hold the, the, the Taliban accountable, recognizing that there is no distinction between the Taliban and al-Qaeda, uh, and uh, we shouldn't pretend that there is. And so I think uh, under that assumption, we should begin to hold them accountable for their actions, and we should begin to ensure that they're isolated. I'm not to say that uh, we can't still see um, positive signs of developments, but I wouldn't count on it. Unfortunately, I think we're dealing with an organization that has changed very little, except in their ability to navigate public relations. And so I think holding them accountable is going to be critical. And again, the U.S. leadership role there will be central. Thank you. I appreciate that uh, clarification. And I think that our audience deserved to uh, hear that. So, Victoria, um, I know that our time is running out, and I just want to ask each of you one last question, which is, uh, again, we've dedicated this episode in celebration of the Abraham Accords warm peace deals. Um, I'm just curious, what are your thoughts on what we need to see from the United States government moving forward so that we can have additional peace in the region? Well, the good news is we don't necessarily need a great deal from the uh, from the United States government. A lot of this can happen from the private sector, uh, you know. But it would be wonderful to have support. I mean, so many of our departments uh, can play a critical role in this. Not just the State Department, not just the National Security Council and the White House, but entities like the Department of Commerce, the Department of Treasury, the Energy Department, and so I think activating all of those elements of the government and connecting them with their regional counterparts can be helpful. And then the final thing I'd say is, is we could also use a great deal of support from Congress. Uh, I think that as individual congressmen and senators discover how uh, positive these relationships can be for their home districts and states, uh, and they can attract either mutual investment from Israeli and Emirati com companies or they can go in, uh, encourage their companies to go into Israel or into Bahrain. Uh, certainly a lot of the agricultural elements Rob was mentioning to go into Sudan and Morocco. You know, this is just a massive opportunity. So I think I think we could also find a happy hunting ground in Congress. 
That, that sounds wonderful. And I think that um, the, the nice thing about turning to members of Congress is that, um, as you know, uh, we have Republican members, we have Democratic members, and so it gives the American people options. So, uh, so that, that's a wonderful recommendation. Rob, I'm also curious your thoughts. I know that you are the head of the Abraham Accords Institute for Peace. I know this is something you're working on on a daily basis. What, what do you think the U.S. government, and I suppose others, can do to help continue peace efforts in the Middle East? Well, look, I, I agree with all of Victoria's comments. I would add, too, that we've seen positive comments from the state, uh, positive statements from the current administration. So even in, as we discussed earlier, uh, Prime Minister Bennett's first visit to the White House as Israeli prime minister, supportive comments for Israel's newfound relationships with its neighbors. Secretary Blinken, likewise, has had the same readouts from calls, uh, as has uh, National Security Advisor Sullivan and others. And so... Uh, it remains our intent to uh, to work and support from the private side as best we can. And and as we've discussed today, there's an enormous amount of potential. It's worth re you know remembering that a number of individuals involved, the core group that negotiated the Abraham Accords, and those, those of us that supported and participated, were businessmen at the end of the day that operate uh, as comfortably in the private as they do in the public, uh, recognizing those domains are different. Congress does have a role to play, and so do the legislatures uh, in uh, in Israel, certainly. And I think we're excited to see the fact that they've got a, a caucus in the Knesset uh, that demonstrates the strong bipartisan support that exists in Israel, but certainly in the United States as well. This is one of the most universally popular and supported initiatives uh, and developments of many, many years. And again, uh, there's a great deal that the private sector can do to support and assist expanding economic and cultural ties. Our goal is to do both. And I think that those ties uh, ultimately will cement the historic agreements achieved just one year ago. And I think that's where the real potential resides. And if those are sound and expanding, I think you'll see new members. And I also think you'll see uh, an evolution in the region that has not previously been possible. And it's a great, it's a great uh, pleasure and it's a great privilege to be part of that. And, and again, thanks very much for, for having me today. Of course. Well, uh, first of all, I have to say amen to that. I think all of us are hoping, praying, anticipating, and willing to work hard to help spread peace through the Middle East, North Africa, and throughout the world. Victoria Coates, Rob Greenway, thank you so much for joining me on Global Perspectives. Thank you, Ali. Thanks very much. The anniversary of the signing of the Abraham Accords is a true cause for celebration. Peace between Israel and her Arab neighbors is something that many of us dreamt of and hoped would take place in our children's or grandchildren's lifetimes. It's been incredibly wonderful for me to see the warm people-to-people -people embrace that's taken place in the region since the signing of the Abraham Accords. I hope to bring you an anniversary edition this time of the year every year going forward. Thanks again for joining me on Global Perspectives. Join me the next time.